Happy New Year! I'm thankful that you've chosen to start the new year by joining us this morning, and I pray that the same desire to seek Jesus that brought you here now continues to guide you throughout 2022. Pastor Brian has a great message for you this morning, one that gets right at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus and trust Him for everything. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Next week, we start back up with our study in the Minor Prophets, and our impact groups begin as well. If you haven't gotten signed up for a group, make sure to do so today because space is dwindling. Everyone who is a part of Central should be in a group, no matter your age or place in life. We all need to hear each other's unique perspectives and encourage one another as we seek Jesus together. So take a look at our available groups and sign up at discovercentral.org backslash groups. This is a great way for you to start the new year and get in on all of the action as God leads us to impact our community for Jesus in 2022. If you're new with us, thank you for being here. We'd love to get to know you and share more about what's happening with Central. The best way to start getting connected with us is by sending us a communication card with your best contact info. If you send us an email address, we'll add you to our weekly email update. And you don't need to worry about us spamming your email or sending a load of random text messages. We try to keep things pretty simple and concise when we communicate. You can also include a note with anything we can pray about for you. The communication card is online at discovercentral.info. And if you'd like to contribute to the Ministry of Central by giving online, you can do that from discovercentral.info as well. Throughout the Christmas season, we've gathered a special Christmas offering for two projects above and beyond our regular giving and missions giving. We set a goal of $12,000 so that we can, one, live stream our Sunday services, and two, provide some assistance to Emily Greenshore's assisted living. And I'm delighted to tell you this morning that we've blown well beyond that $12,000 goal. We're already working on the details to make live streaming happen, and any additional funds in this offering will increase the amount of help we can offer to Emily Green Shores. And it's not too late for you to join in this opportunity to bless others. We'll continue to collect the Christmas offering throughout January. Thank you for such an exceptional effort to do good beyond our four walls in the Central Campus. Well, there are lots of things to celebrate this morning because we also had the chance to bless nearly 100 children throughout the world with the Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes that you packed. And they were recently delivered. Check out this video of the impact you made through those gifts. Three, two, yeah! At the count of three, when children opened the shoeboxes, they're so excited. Those faces just transform. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. The mouth is wide open, the voice is raised, smiles are all over. That box brings joy. We're right now in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. And that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Churches are doing big things with Operation Christmas Child. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. We couldn't do it without them. With this box, they do get the gospel story. They do hear about Jesus. It has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ. I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in fill shoe boxes? Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. After receiving the shoe boxes, the children will be invited to go to the greatest journey, which is a 12 lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. 
After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a Bible in their own language. Nag-istorya adu pi idinga kanta mo may kampaid ang kankan dadita sa anguma. Imbasa mo ba si idinga ni Papa, ni Lola, ni Lolo, ni Papa, Mama, kat Mama ti daken ni Apo Diyos. When the light of the gospel is turned on, that changes everything. Churches are being planted, lives are being changed, communities are being transformed. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. I would like to ask you to consider packing shoeboxes year-round. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you.
Christmas season is a time to rejoice. The King of all kings, he left his throne on high to be received here on earth as the Lord of all. And when we worship him, we embrace what Jesus really means. He's our hope, our savior, and our redeemer. The glory and the wonder, it still hangs in the air. The star that saw his face still shines. The song heard at the manger, the angel anthem raised, still echoes through the ages today. Rejoice, peace on earth has come, his favor rests on us, his name is Jesus. Rejoice, the King has come for us, receive what love has done, his name is Heaven's hope awaken with a baby's cry, and still his voice breaks through. second day of the new year and with new years comes new year's resolutions and i'm sure you've had yours over the year i've had some of mine over these years and uh just to give you a few examples there's like exercising more there's getting organized learning a new skill or hobby um traveling more quit doing something unhealthy for you if you want to take a moment right now since this is the online service you can leave a comment on what your new year resolution is and um I always find myself landing on something that wants me to read more books because I don't really enjoy reading books too often, but it's something I know I should be doing. 
And I really wish that somebody would just read a book to me, kind of like an audio book kind of thing. So that's what I always want to do is read more books. And if you're joining us this morning, you are in for a treat because we are going to start you off on your New Year's resolution of reading more books by reading a book. And we have a good one for you. Uh, the book we're reading this morning is That's Good, That's Bad by Marjorie Kyer. And uh, it's a good one, so let's, let's listen in. One day, a little boy went to the zoo with his mother and father. They bought him a shiny red balloon. It lifted him high into the sky. Wow! Oh, that's good. No, that's bad. The balloon drifted for miles and miles until it came to a hot, steamy jungle. It broke on the branch of a tall, prickly tree. Pop! Oh, that's bad. No, that's good. The little boy fell into a muddy river. Splat! He climbed up into a roly-poly hippopotamus and rode to shore. Giddy up! Oh, that's good. No, that's bad. Ten noisy baboons were squabbling in the grass by the river. They chased the little boy up a tree until he was out of breath. <sighs> oh, that's bad. No, that's good. The baboons wanted to play vine swing with the little boy. What fun! The little boy grabbed a vine and swung out of their reach. Whee! Oh, that's good. No, that's bad. The vine was big, was a big, scary snake that wiggled and jiggled and hissed. Oh, that's bad. No, that's good. The little boy lost his grip. Whoops. And landed on the back of a giraffe. Hooray! Oh, that's good. No, that's bad. The giraffe leaned over to drink some swampy water. Glug, glug. The little boy slid down his neck and fell into some quicksand next to the elephant. Slop. Oh, that's bad. No, that's good. The elephant grabbed up the little boy with his trunk and lifted him up, up, up onto his shoulders. Whoosh. Oh, that's good. No, that's bad. The elephant thumped bumpily along the grassy plain where it stopped to feed. The little boy climbed down its trunk and woke up a daddy lion snoring in the grass. Shh. Oh, that's bad. No, that's good. When the lion saw the little boy, it purred and licked the little boy's face. Ooh, that's good. No, that's bad. The little boy got all wet and sticky, yuck, and ran in deeper into the jungle. It was, a, it was dark as night, ooh, and the little boy was afraid. He sat down and started to cry, boo-hoo. Oh, that's bad. No, that's good. His tears made such a big puddle that the stork came along to have a drink and picked up the little boy with his beak. Whish. Oh, that's good. No, that's bad. The stork flew the little boy across the dark, windy sky. Flap, flap. The little boy thought he would never see his parents again. Sob. Oh, that's bad. No, that's good. The stork knew exactly where it was going, and it took the little boy back to the zoo and dropped him into his parents' arms. Plop. His mother and father were so happy to see them that they gave him a big hug and a big kiss. That's good. No, that's great. So if you had reading one book as one of your uh, resolutions this year, then congratulations, you've achieved your goal, and I'm really proud of you. But as we look at uh, this book, it's just a mental roller coaster, the ups and downs that we see. We look at something and we think, oh man, that's a good thing that's happening. But it turns out, no, that was a bad thing that's happened. And then we look at the bad things and say, man, that's a bad thing that's happening, and say, oh, no, it's actually a good thing that's happening. And... You know, it's not until we get to the end of the story where we see the whole picture on how all this works together. But it still doesn't stop us from seeing something right in the moment and saying, oh, you know what, that's a good thing, or that's a bad thing. And it's not until we take a step back, look at the whole picture, where we can say, okay, all of this worked out for good. And that's what we need to do sometimes when it comes to trusting God. You know, we're getting small bits of the story, but if we take a step back and look at the big picture, then we can know that we can trust God and He has a plan for what's happening. But that's the kicker, trust. You see, you and I, we're living in a time where trust is just not something that comes easy to us. You can't trust anything nowadays. You can't trust the news, the politicians, your government, the vaccine, uh, that 7-Eleven hot dog, or you know that extended car warranty call that you're getting. It's whatever it is, fill in the blank with whatever it might be. It's hard to trust nowadays. But whatever we're going through with whatever situation, can we trust God with it? Uh, or is it too hard to trust God? 
you know, it's easy when we're going through really good times to uh, trust in God and say everything's going well. But are we in an active, growing relationship with God to where when those hard times do come, that we can stand strong? You know, Joseph learned what it meant to trust God through difficulty, and he experienced a lot of difficult things in his life. And today, I want to look at his life and see how we can trust God no matter what, because he trusted God no matter what. And when we walk away today, we can say, you know what, God, no matter what happens, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to trust you with all my heart and lean not unto my own understanding. Because this story of Joseph is basically an extended version of that's good, that's bad. So let's go ahead and start it in Genesis 37, uh, verses 1 through 11. It says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he also made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. And so he said to them, Please hear this dream of which I dreamed. And there they were, binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf stood, arose and stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and all of his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and at this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bow down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, uh, and his father kept the matter in mind. So as we're already starting to read this story, you can already put together the that's good, that's bad throughout this story. And the first thing we know is that he's 17 years old. He is his father's favorite child, and that's not accepted well by his other brothers. In fact, there was so much favoritism, he gets this colorful coat. And because of that, the Bible says that they hated him. So they hated their brother. And because of this hatred, um, you know, things weren't good, but then he, Joseph then tells him of these dreams that he's having. And because of that, that's the straw that breaks the back and says, you know what, we need to do something about this. So they, later on, they start to have this plot in order to kill Joseph. Um, and then at the, after that, he is then sold to some merchants. But it's a hard time that it's upcoming for Joseph. And, you know, everybody has hard times. And uh, some have harder than others. It's not a contest or anything like that. But sometimes you might be hearing somebody share their their burdens with you, and then you might have the thought, man, I wish, I wish we could trade because, you know, that doesn't sound too bad. Um, but rarely do we ever look at a problem that somebody has and see it as an opportunity to trust God. And that's, I mean, that's, that's big. I mean, do we have money that, or we get the rent coming up and we don't have the money for it, or we don't have enough money for food, or, you know, somebody might be sick. Do we see that problem as an opportunity to trust God? Or do we see it as something else, an opportunity just to worry and be scared? But in the story for Joseph, things went from good to bad really quickly. And he must have felt scared and completely alone in that pit. But thankfully, he wasn't. God was with him the whole time. And when you're alone, and when I'm alone, we can trust that God is with you. But in those, first, those times when we're alone and things aren't going well, our first thought might be, you know what, what do I need to do to get out of this situation? What do I need to do to fix this? And we'll try that. Maybe we'll try it a few more times and just be unsuccessful, unsuccessful. And then it's not until later on when we're exhausted all of our options, then we'll go to God. But what is it going to take to go to God first instead of using him as a last resort? You know, God is with you, but you can also have other people with you as well. You know, I love my, fam my church family here at uh, Central. And one of the things that keeps me close to them is being in an impact group. And not only is it a great opportunity just to uh, talk about what happened in the sermon and talk more about, you know, Bible knowledge, but it's also a good time just to come along one another, you know, share your burdens with one another, love one another, pray for one another, one another. And that's just what I love about it. So it really helps my relationship with others here. So if you're looking for that, next week is impact groups are starting. I really encourage you guys to uh, get involved in that. So back to Joseph. We have two themes with this story. 
One theme is just that there's conflict within this family. And another theme is that there's some dreams going on. So he was basically having these visions of what's going to be happening. And because he's sharing this with his family, sharing this with his brothers, they hated him. And uh, so this first dream is talking about a sheaf. Okay, so all these sheaves are going on. If you don't know what a sheaf is, we can throw a picture up right now. But it's basically some grain that is uh, laid on top of each other, wrapped up, and uh, basically for after it's reaped. So this is what a, sh a sheaf looks like. And, uh, and it's really cool because this gr type of grain is going to play an important part in our story later on down the road. And this is just a small picture to show you that God's in control through this whole situation. And it's just really cool to see. But anyways, all these sheaves are bowing down to Joseph's sheaves. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out what this means. So the brothers like, so let me get this straight. We're all sheaves. You're a sheaf. I'm a sheaf. And you're, you're saying that you're the chief sheaf? Is that what's going on here? And we're going to bow down to you? Well, guess what? I'm not happy about that. In fact, we hate you. And uh, their disapproval was very clear. And uh, just about this dream that was going to happen. He was basically saying, I have this divine decree that's going to be happening. So they hated him for it. And then he comes back and shares another dream that he has. And before we get into that, let me ask you this question. Has something ever happened in your life to where it was just a random thing that you thought happened? It was just a random chance and you're like, wow, that was pretty random. I can't believe that happened to me. But then later on, that same thing happens to you again. And you're like, huh, wait a minute. And then it happens to you a third time. And you're like, okay, something's definitely up here. Now let me ask you another question. You have your phone and it rings and it's a number that you don't recognize. What do you do? Well, some of you are probably saying right now, you know, just let it ring, send it to voicemail, just don't answer it. And that's what, you know, the normal answer is. But you know what? Not me. I like to answer uh, those phone calls and I like to know what's happening on the, on the other line. It's an opportunity for something. I don't know. I just got to know. So a couple years ago, my phone rings. I don't recognize the number, but it's a 757 number, so I answer it. And I say, hello. And they say, hey, Michael, what's going on? And uh, if this is your first time uh, you're, you're visiting and you don't know me, my name is not Michael. It's Brian. So this was very interesting. So obviously I answer back and say, nothing much. What's going on with you? And he says, well, I'll tell you what's going on. My client is interested in your client's house. So are you still ac accepting any offers? So then I'm thinking here for a moment, okay, just focus for a second, Brian. Okay, your name's Michael. You sound like you're a real estate agent. This person wants to sell a house. Let's see what we can do. So then I reply, oh, well, who's asking? Wh who's this on the other line? And then uh, he says his name. He says what company he's with. And he says, I called about an hour ago, left you a voicemail, but I, did I didn't hear back from you. So I didn't know that he called. I didn't know I had a voicemail. But that makes this situation even 10 times weirder because at the time, my voicemail was of me basically singing a song saying that I'm not available. So he heard that me singing in this voicemail and, start, and thought, hey, this person's a real estate agent. But um, and in case you're wondering, it's not there right now. So don't you don't have to call me right now. It's, it's no longer one of my greetings. Um, but then I ask, hey, you know, did you like my voicemail? I worked really hard on it, but he kind of brushed that off. And he's like, so are you accepting any offers? And I was like, well, I'll have to get back to you. And then we ended the conversation there. And I was like, well, that was weird. That was just a random thing that happened. But then it turns out it wasn't that random because not too long after that, I got a text. And, uh, and it says this, hello, I'm interested in purchasing a property you own and would like to have a quick chat when you're available. So then again, I'd, I'd like to be a part of this. And I say, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, how interested would you say that you are? And they said, 9 to 10, can you tell me about the condition? And I say, oh, sorry, I have another client who, who answered 12. So I think they're going to win it. So thank you for your interest. And then again, another text showed up and said, hey, Michael, just a courtesy call that we're going to show your house at this address tomorrow morning. And uh, I'll let you know what my buyers think. And this is blah, blah with the real estate group. And I was like, oh, yes, what a fine house that is on that road. Feel free, uh, feel out your client to see if he or she would be interested in paying 50000 more than the asking price. I'm thinking of raising the price some. And then they said, this is their top price. And I said, what if I throw in a free pizza with the purchase of the home? And that kind of killed their conversation there. They stopped texting me. And then another one, this is the last one I'll share. 
Hi, can I show this address at 5 p.m.? Thank you. And then they share their name and their company. Okay, well, I need to clean up a little bit. Me and the boys had to sleep over there last night, but it should be good to go by 5 o'clock. And then they said, okay, any CBS? And then I said, this house has it all. CBS, NBC, ABC, and Fox. So uh, looking into that a little bit further, CBS means call before showing. So I got that one wrong. But it was clear. It was very, very clear. This wasn't a random thing happening to me. My number was out there on some sort of real estate uh, you know, website or whatever it might be. And I guess I'm a real estate agent now. Not a very good one, but I guess I'm, I'm kind of one. So I share that point uh, to make this point. And Ian Fleming, the guy who wrote the James Bond series, he makes this uh, point as well. And he says, you know, if something happens one time, then it's just a random chance. He says it's just a chance. If something happens twice, it's a coincidence. But if something happens three times, then it's a pattern. So if somebody wins the lottery, okay, that can happen. It's just a random chance. If someone wins lottery two times in a row, Okay, something's up here. If someone interprets a dream, okay, maybe you got lucky, you got guessed what's going on, but if someone interprets a dream correctly again and again and again, then something's up here. And that's what's going on with the situation in Joseph. And the thing that's going on and the thing that's up is that God's in control here and that he's up to something. So when something happens repeatedly, something's going on over and over again, Uh, That means that we need to really pay attention to what's going on. And we see that a lot in the Bible where authors will repeat themselves. They'll see the same thing happening over and over again. Um, Just to give you an example, you see Gideon. um, He needs needs an example of that that God wants him to do something. So he says, all right, I want this fleece to be wet and I want all the ground around it to be dry. And then that happens and then he says, okay, maybe that was just the chance. Maybe that was lucky. I want the fleece to be dry and the ground all around it to be wet. Um, so then that happens. But then we see a Joseph. He, didn't just, he doesn't just get lucky with just one dream interpretation. He gets all of them right. Out of the ones that we see, every single one of them comes true. So this goes to show you that God is at work And don't be confused. This isn't Joseph working on his own. This is God working through Joseph. It's all God. And then we see this second dream that he had. And then one thing that we can see throughout this whole story of Joseph is that all of these dreams come in pairs. We see these first two, and then we see the next two with the uh, butler and the butcher, and then we see the last two with uh, Pharaoh. But these dreams come in pairs, and they kind of go in tandem with one another and just kind of help support one another to say that this is going to happen. So we got two groups, uh, three groups of dreams here. We got the, uh, the first group, which is what we're in now. We got a second group coming up, and then the third group. But with Joseph, he had a job to do uh, with his brothers. He wanted to check on his brothers, and then he also was to check on the condition of the flock. And then he runs into this man, verse number 15 and 17. This man is talked about. Some people say that this man wasn't a man, but it was an angel. And some other people just say it was just a man. But either way, God's hand is at work here. And the way we know that is because this man helps him find his brothers. He helps him get this situation going on and kind of just helps this, where we're at right now in the story, just this terrible situation. And we just think like, man, where is God in all of this right now? Because why didn't God send an angel to help Joseph and accomplish his will some other way? I mean, he sent an angel with Jacob was running from Esau and helped him out in that situation. Why couldn't he do that there? Well, In such danger, we see the deepest silence of God and silence of angels. But at the end of the story, we see how much good that God is going to draw from everything that's going on. Then the time comes for the betrayal to happen. And then one of the brothers just isn't all right with it. His name is Reuben. So he hears this story of how they want to kill Joseph. And they say, hey, let's do something a little bit different. Let's not kill him, but let's just throw him in a pit. So what he wanted to do in verse number 22, he was saying, you know what? Well, I'm going to try to do my own little rescue plan, have Joseph in the pit, everyone leaves, and then I'll come rescue him later. So we see that Reuben is actually a good brother, and that's probably why they named a sandwich after him. So then Joseph, he was thrown into this pit. Reuben had this plan of trying to save him. But before you do that, we'll just see how it affected the brothers. Were they sorry that they did it? What happened going on here? Well, verse number 25, it says, they sat down to eat. They sat down to eat, and they just wanted to keep things normal. They continued on with their life, and uh, I guess, you know, throwing someone in a pit and leaving them for dead just works up an appetite, but it just goes to show you that there was no remorse for Joseph here. 
And that is a scary place to be when you are not, when you are just numb to sin and it doesn't affect you. It's just a real scary place to be. But it doesn't stop there. And then while they were eating, Judah has a plan. What gain do we have having them in a pit? Instead, let's sell them off and then we'll get some money out of this whole situation. So they sell them to some merchants. And then Reuben goes back to try to do his plan. He's not there. He is grieved to figure out what happened. And then they got to tell something to their dad. So they get that colorful coat. They dip it in some blood. They hand it off to Jacob and say, we found this. And then let him kind of fill in the blanks of the story there. So they were just deceiving at this time. They're trying to spare themselves from any wrongdoing in the situation. So all this doesn't look good for Joseph right now. He's on his way to Egypt. And uh, he's probably feeling alone. And also, he's probably just thinking that life just doesn't make sense right now. What wrongdoing have I done to get myself in the situation? But there's a truth that Joseph hung on to, and there's a truth that me and you can hang on to as well, is when life doesn't make sense, God is with you. And when we read on, we can see that that was true for Joseph, and God was with him and gave him great success. Let's continue reading in uh, Genesis 39, 1 through 6. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of the house, and then all that he had put under his authority. And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of the house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Alright, so things were going well at this moment and if we stop the story right here... It could be somewhat of a happy ending, but we still wouldn't know if all of his dreams had come true yet. Um, But then someone enters the equation. It's Potiphar's wife, and it's this woman who's so naughty, the Bible doesn't even give her a name. She's Potiphar's wife, and she starts making advances at him because we see that Joseph, he is a, a handsome man. So she makes several advances at him, and he rejects, makes the right choice every single time. And it says day by day that she would do this, and she would try to just bring down his defenses a little bit. Hey, why don't you just lay down next to me? That's all. That's all. Just lay down next to me. And, uh, you know, temptation came, and he always made the right decision, and he even wanted to uh, not be in the same room with her anymore. He didn't want anything to look bad, no accusations to even be possible. So then she got a little bit more aggressive, grabbed at his clothes, and then ripped his clothes, and he had a decision to make. And good thing he had integrity. And he, at, he said this, How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So having integrity is really important. But also, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. It, it means something to some people, but other people, it just, it's a joke. It doesn't mean anything to you. What's your integrity worth to you? Are you going to cheat in order to win a game? Are you, uh, if you're given too much money back at the checkout, do you return it? You know, do you tell your kid, hey, I know you're five years old, but tell him that you're four years old so that we get a free meal. Um, Integrity is an important thing. I'm going to share a quick story just of uh, the tennis player Andy Rodick. Back in 2005, he was playing in this tournament in Italy, and he was playing against Verdasco, his opponent. He was uh, supposed to win. He was the favorite, and it got down to the match point, and then uh, Verdasco hit it, and it went out, and then the yay he wins, but then he stopped everything, and everyone was like, what's going on? And he says, nope, that was actually in. Check it out. So he made sure everything was right. He told the ref. The ref fixed it. And now this dude had another chance to win, and he took advantage of that, and Verdasco actually came back and won after that. So his integrity cost him tens of thousands of dollars, and even more if he were to go on and do better in the tournament. But we might be looking at that story and say, man, that's crazy. And I think of my own professional sports teams that I like and say, come on, man, take the win. We need this. But it just goes to show you to Andy Roddick that uh, integrity was way more important than money. And integrity was really important to Joseph, too. And he had a hard choice to make. This woman aggressively went after him. So what did he do? 
He doubled down on his decision. He ran. He got out of there. He fled. He didn't grab no shoes or nothing. He was gone. And he, uh, he made the right decision. But sometimes when we make that right, wise, godly decision, there's still consequences. And that's unfair. You know, I wish there was a verse that we could look up right now that we could counter-reference this and say, if you make the wise, godly decision, then you will never experience hard times. Everything will work out. But that verse doesn't exist. It was his word against her word, and obviously her word was the winner. And then he was thrown in prison. But God was with him in this situation. And you think, how is God with him in this situation? That sounds terrible. Well, first off, he was with him because of the circumstances of him being thrown in jail. Because back then, if the servant was sleeping with the master's wife, you didn't go to prison. You didn't collect $200. You get put to death. Okay, And it even says in there that Potiphar's was uh, burned with anger. So how did that not happen? How did Joseph not get put to death? Well, the answer is that God was in control and his hand was upon him to preserve, preserve his life again. So then we see God start to give him success in the prison. And there was these other guys that were in there and they were having some dreams and now we're in group two of our dreams that we're having. He interprets those dreams. They come out correctly. We got the butcher and the baker. Doesn't work out. Or, uh, sorry, the uh, baker and the butler. It doesn't work out well for the baker, but the butler gets restored to his position. And uh, they says, hey, when you're up there, please tell Pharaoh about me. Please remember me. But the butler does not. So Joseph is still in prison for a couple more years. And it must have been tough, but he had to know, hey, God's in control. I can trust him. But then we start to see how things uh, work out for Joseph He's probably still feeling alone. You know, life didn't make sense. But he was about to have his big moment to where he was made for this, where God brought him here for such a time as this. And when the pressure is on for Joseph, the pressure is on for you, for me, you can trust that God is with you. Let's read in Genesis 41, verse number 9. It says, Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants, he put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream, and one night, he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us in there, the servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to our own dream. And... It came to pass that he interpreted for us, and so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, brought him out quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I heard that you can understand a dream, so interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And then he goes on to tell him the dream that he has. So Pharaoh called in all these experts in order to try to, you know, understand his dream, to interpret his dream. He called in magicians and whoever else it might be. Um, But then, finally, this butler's memory is jogged and say, wait a minute, I know a guy. There's a guy that's down in prison right now. might be able to help out. So then he brings Joseph up, gets him all cleaned up, and then he shares these dreams with him. He says, you know what, I've had these dreams of cows, these dreams of grain. And then Joseph says something important. Yeah, we can, we can tell you what it means because dreams is God's domain. All the interpretations belong to him. If he wants to let us know what that interpretation is, he will. And he did because the Lord was with Joseph. So he says that there were seven, these fat cows, and then seven of these skinny cows. And then the seven Skinny cows, ugly cows, ate the fat cows. And then kind of the similar dream with, dream with uh, seven of the fat stalks, seven of these skinny stalks. And then he says, you know what? These are kind of similar dreams. We're going to have seven years of abundant resources, abundant food. And then we're going to have seven years of famine. So God made this event known to Pharaoh in order to prepare what he's going to do. And he said it to him twice. Remember, once a chance and then continue on as you say more things and it gets more and more real. So then they recognize the wisdom of Joseph. They put him in charge in order to try to help carry out this plan. And, you know, standing before Pharaoh like that, it must have been a lot of pressure. And because he was willing to trust God and give God the interpretation uh, that he got from God, 
So many people would be saved because of this famine, including his own family. So if we were to continue reading on the story, we would see that all of it came true, that we did see those seven good years and then the seven years of famine. And then because of that famine, it led uh, Joseph's family to come right before him. And after a few weeks of back and forth, it was quite the family reunion. Um, But then Joseph couldn't take it anymore. He revealed his identity. He forgave them for all that he did. And then he said these words to them, which is true for the whole story of Joseph. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So because of their wise administration with Joseph leading it, they were able to save so many people because of this plan that God had for him. And you know, this story is tough. It might have some of us thinking like, if God was really with him, why did all those bad things happen to him? And you know, I don't really have an answer for that too much because hard things happen and it's just something that we have to deal with. And uh, God does allow suffering to be in the world, but this isn't God's uh, first and foremost plan. We're all in plan B right now because God's first plan was perfection. You know, in the Garden of Eden, everything was absolutely perfect. But then we messed that up. You know, we sinned and now there's sin in the world and there's going to be suffering in this world. And uh, there's even suffering for God's own son. You know, he sent Jesus just to suffer for a, a punishment that we deserve. But that's because he loves us. And, uh, and he also loves us and he promises to be with us no matter what's happening in our lives. And if we read this story and we focus on all the bad things, then we're missing out on the, uh, the true meaning here. So God is taking bad things and making good results. And it tells us that he's in control. And he puts this family in this situation to help save so many other people. So my guess is that most of us aren't going to find ourselves in front of a king who's the fate of the nation's are in the balance and we have to interpret dreams about cows. You know, that's probably not going to happen to us. But we do face pressures in our life. And even Jesus faced pressures as he stood before these religious leaders and these uh, powerful people and um, some trials that he had in the last days of his life. And even the, um, the apostles did as well as they went out and tried to share Jesus with others. So the pressure we experience may not be the same, but it doesn't mean we don't face pressures. But when the pressure's on, we can trust that God is with us. So let's review this story, shall we? So Joseph, he was loved by his father. That's good. But then he was his father's favorite and his brothers plotted against him and threw him into a pit. That's bad. The pit was empty. I guess that's good. He was sold to some merchants uh, far away from his family. That's bad. But he he was brought to Potiphar's house and he was put in charge of everything. That's good. But then Potiphar's wife, she lied and got him thrown in jail. That's bad. But in the jail, he was made in charge of all uh, the inmates. That's good. Then the butler forgets him. That's bad. But then the butler remembers him. He's brought up and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams and he saves so many people from a terrible famine that's coming. That's great. So throughout history, God has been faithful and he keeps his promises to us. And one thing I just want us to take away today is that you can trust God no matter what. And that's tough. You know, sometimes we go through really hard things and we just got to tie a knot onto that and hold on. Uh, But God, he loves us, you know, from being powerful enough to create the whole universe to being personal enough to want to have that relationship and love us through Jesus. God has proved that he can be trusted in every circumstance and God has a plan. Sometimes we just get this much of the story, but for us to know that God is faithful and that he is worthy, and we can depend on him, we can trust in him, so that we only see this much, but we know that there's this much going on, and for us to take a step back and say, okay, God, I don't quite understand, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm going to trust you, because I know you love me, I know you know more than me, and uh, you know, it might be tempting to stop trusting God in those hard times, but that's when we need to trust him the most, because what doesn't make sense to us, makes sense to God. So now the question comes to us, what do we need to trust God with right now and when those difficult times come are we going to fold under the pressure and try to do things ourselves and try to work ourselves out of the situation are we going to take a step back and say God you know what I don't understand what's going on but I know that you're in control and I'm going to trust you for that and I hope it's the latter because God is worthy he's faithful and uh, we can trust him so let's spend this new year trusting God no matter what let's pray God, we're so thankful for who you are and just your promises. And we can see your faithfulness, uh, your sovereignty throughout this story, God. But we just pray that in our own lives, that when we're going through those tough 
situations that we can just be reminded that you're there for us, God, and that um, whatever it might be that you're with us and uh, we don't have to go it alone. Uh, just help us to know that uh, just when it even seems the hardest, God, that uh, you're there with us and we can trust you no matter what. God, we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Thanks for starting your New Year's off with us here at Central. We pray that no matter what, this is a year of growth in your relationship with Jesus and with others. Happy New Year.